Okay. Welcome to the final session. This session is reflections, and we reflect on what we have learned today. It's a pretty difficult task to cover the whole range, um, but to help us, we have Fran O'Sullivan, uh, who will lead the discussion with these three wise heads here. Fran uh, is a prominent New Zealand Herald columnist who writes on business, politics, foreign affairs and trade. She was previously the editor of the New Zealand Business Review and Fran holds a series of positions in, on boards and advisory councils dealing with USA, China, Pacific Islands, as well as New Zealand focused business research. Many of, all of you will also know her as a TV star. <laughs> she appears on many of the business and political programs such as Q&A. You can see that she has a wide range of experience and knowledge, and Fran, I'd like you to use that uh, to help these three wise heads try and crystallise what we have learnt today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, just to introduce the panel, all of whom are, are leaders in their own right. Uh, on my left, John Lohan, who is uh, chair of the uh, Meat Industry Association. John opened the conference, uh, I think twice really, in the last 24 hours. Uh, he's also a professional director of several companies in Agri, former chair of Zespri. And, you know, I mean, you have a man here who has an extraordinary breadth of experience and knowledge right across agribusiness in New Zealand. Next to John is Lindy Nelson. Uh, she's chair of the Agri Women's Development Trust. And I've observed Lindy actually over several years now. Uh, Lindy has, has been a real power uh, within the women's side of Agri, bringing forward women as leaders and to take their rightful place, not just on farm, but right throughout the industry. Uh, she's a red meat f farmer and she has a vigor she's a vigorous advocate. She even called in at the breakfast show this morning on her way into the conference, so a very busy lady. And finally, Andrew Morrison, uh, Chair of Beef and Lamb New Zealand, a Southern South Island sheep farmer, who's also just flown in this morning, but from the United States, where he's been attending the Tihono Stanford uh, Boot Camp, which is held annually, as many of you know. And it brings together about 70 CEOs across the sector and other leaders who are committed to innovation and transformation of New Zealand's primary sectors. Uh, it's been a great day. I've learnt so much and, um, you know, it's really quite hard to know where to start. But let's start anyway. And John, you were looking for an interesting and thought-provoking day. Uh, good news out this morning from uh, Tim Ritchie and the MIA that uh, exports were up for sheep and beef products, increased by 8% in the year to June 2019. So that looks very rosy. But the world's changing quite quickly, and particularly for red meat sector, and there's some challenges out there. I'd like to hear about what your prime takeout is from today. Uh, yeah, the prime takeout I took was that we as the sector leaders uh, have a much bigger job to do than we've been doing in batting our corner. I think the, uh, the messages out of the first session on nutrition uh, highlighted how much, to me, how much we've left a space to be filled with stupidity. Um, um, and, you know, you know, going back in history, I was always taught that a balanced diet uh, involved uh, vegetables, it involved uh, red meat, it involved uh, nuts and grains and fruits and so forth. Um, and, um, you know, there was a very stark message today that re completely reinforced that, that red meat has a compelling part in a proper balanced diet and that there are agendas to push us out of that space. So I think also batting our corner in the environmental space, um, you know, we've we've done a lot behind the scenes. We've worked together as, as sector leaders very, very closely, um, but we're going into a stage where policy is going to be determined uh, and the voice of the entire sector is going to be critically important in getting sensible outcomes that are good for the sector, good for rural communities and good for New Zealand. Yeah, Lindy, I mean, you've also been here all day. Um, what are farmers thinking? And as a farmer yourself, 
How challenged are you personally about what you're hearing? And what are the stories that you feel need to be got across so that the positive contribution that red meat makes is actually understood? Yeah, well, we'll try to do... Is that on? Yeah, tried to do that this morning with Hayley Holt on The Breakfast Show. So um, I think there's a number of things. I think sense making is really important. So I think a lot of farmers out there are really struggling to make sense of the whole landscape and what that actually means for them um, in their business. Obviously, the ETS is really challenging, um, but it, I think there's a huge opportunity there as well. Look, I think fair is actually a really valid thing that people are feeling at the moment. And so we're looking for strong leadership and, and some strong way forward from the sector. And I, I'm really encouraged to see that that is actually occurring. Um, keep on telling those stories, but um, telling them in a way that isn't telling, but showing. And I think that's really important. I think we've maybe have got a little bit wrong around what influence looks like. And you know, if you look at the influence pyramid, um, telling sits right at the top. So we have to find a way of sharing uh, what we do uh, with actually our local constituents. You know, people could call it social license, but actually bringing New Zealanders on board. I mean, I guess my aim personally is if New Zealanders, you know, have such pride and think we're world class in cricket, rugby, and netball, why do they think we're not world class in farming? Because we absolutely are. I mean, it's not going to happen, is it, without collaboration, however, Andrew. And I mean, you've come in from Tehono. I mean, one of the things that um, Damien O'Connor said uh, prior to that was the need to evolve a vision to action that will require stronger government and industry partnership more than before. Mm, well, just to start, I'm kind of slightly nervous sitting here in the red seat. I got one of these things on my lapel, John. Somebody joked here, this is like the Graham Norton show. <laughs> and, and, I, and I kind of feel if I give a dumb answer, I'll just go over the back. <laughs> I'll hold on to the... Um... <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're right, Fran. I, I suppose, um, so I've only been in the chair about 18 months, but what I've quickly witnessed is we've got, we've got a lot of challenges. Now, I think, I think we've always had challenges... Um, across the sector but what I don't think we've done wisely is uh, I'll just let Tim get his phone here for a minute sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that was Tim, Tim so you can all get a drink off him later. But uh, so, so, so challenges aren't a new thing. So I'm involved in two um, investment funds and you know every time you walk in and review those investment funds they're going to use the word volatility. That's what the guys are going to say. That's, that's a known known. So we're no, it's a known known we're going to have challenges in our sector. What we're charged with is how we respond to those challenges and whether we do it by ourselves or whether we do it with a wider group. So that's what I was really interested in in my new role because we were collaborating really heavily with the likes of John. Um, the farming leaders group's been created, so on these you know, the issues that you heard in the political spectrum before. Mm -hmm. And then even all the presentations this morning around the challenges of the stupidity ref you refer to, John, we've got to ask ourselves, should we be doing what this methane stuff with... Um, ruminant producers from other countries. I mean, there's no point us doing this stuff alone and then not informing some of our other um, people involved in the rural sector and other, other areas. So I suppose what I'm challenged with is how do we get the best result to give the answers and actually do it as collaboratively as we can, mm -hmm. acknowledging the commercial spaces. Mm -hmm. Just drilling down, um, I was quite struck by Frederick Leroy's uh, presentation this morning about red meat facing the challenges of the post-truth era. And some unhelpful comment by media. Uh, he did mention The Guardian, uh, didn't really talk too much about New Zealand. But, um, you know, linkages from sponsoring um, think tanks uh, through to interests associated, for instance, with impossible foods. Now, we don't hear too much about just who is um, pushing the debate and what those agendas are. Is there room to hear more about that in New Zealand? And I put that to the whole panel. <coughs> Well, the answer's got to be yes, um, and um, I mean, I think the the linkage of um, animal farming to environmental degradation is something we've really, really got to counter strongly. I think uh, I, th I think there are there are deviant agendas at play here uh, globally, and I think we do have to address them globally, but we've also got to address them uh, in our own market. Uh, so, um, you know. I'm not troubled by uh, the idea that some people uh, won't eat meat. That's a matter of personal choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if I look around the world, we are losing some consumers to um, 
to, to vegetarianism and veganism. At the same time, we're gaining a lot of affluent people around the world as people are lifted out of poverty into the global middle class. So the, 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 our job is to make sure that there is a proper, fa a proper fact base out there for co global consumers to make good decisions. And you know, I'll respect their decisions whichever way they make them. Mm. Absolutely, yes. I think, you know, the veil has to come off and people have to understand what has been driven and how that's been done. Uh, good investigative journalism. Do we have that still in New Zealand? Um, I think we do. Uh, it's lurking Buy a in, sub. Yeah, it's lurking in the corners. Um, and it's, it, look, it's a really interesting thing that values, you know, I am worried that people don't eat meat. Mm -hmm. You know, my background was initially um, in health. And so if you see the impact, particularly of children who are vegans, it's, it's not great. And so, you know, what is the health outcomes um, going forward for that sort of thing? It's really interesting. I, I loved the story this morning that Jeff told about values. And I've got a little funny little saying, you know, people eat their values. But they only eat them to a certain level, don't they? Because we had a great story about mm. when they went to Kensington and bought uh, in the supermarket. But then when they went out, they never asked any questions. And so there's, there's, a, there's a piece there that I think needs, needs unlocking. Mm. Uh, yeah, Fran, I think, I think it would be naive to think that there's different groups don't have agendas, but some of those agendas are actually good and take mm -hmm. us to a better place, and some of those agendas will, would be questionable. Um, so it would be naive to think that they weren't there. Look, let's just well, say so there's just been today launched the, uh, the wintering um, expose in relation to wintering on crops in, in some mm -hmm. of our wetter regions. Now, in context, I know we're all a little fearful around that, but in some, in some ways, you know, highlighting some bad mm -hmm. practices will lead us to a better space. One of the things that I did witness this last week was venture capital investment driving agendas. So when people invest heavily in new stuff, are they in fundamentally investing in it because they believe in it, or are they investing in it because they think they can get a quite a super return out of it? So it was just something quite, it was really interesting to watch. Yeah, it was quite interesting, wasn't it, looking at um, the questioning around the emissions and, and the points that were made in that initial presentation of no one questions cement, for instance, and things like this. And I think those were very interesting takeouts when you look right across the gamut of the modern world. So we heard also about, you know, at Michael Burge's um, absolute passion for expanding consumer access to grass-fed certified organic beef and the trends there. But he, he tended to get across that a lot of the answers are actually in your own hands about how you do your marketing, how you create that premium, premiumization, which I can never say. And I know, John, that's something you've got some ideas on. Yeah, look, pre premiumization is, is a real challenge and a real opportunity. Um, and um, you've got to find a, a basis for a premium. In, in what you're doing, and, and we've seen some good examples of that in the New Zealand meat industry. They tend to be um, smaller examples, but I also think that we tend to think about the meat industry as one, whereas in reality there are a lot of different sorts of products that flow from, from an animal that go through different channels to market and not all of them you necessarily want to or be able to premiumise. Um, for example, uh, lamb going into hot pots through restaurant chains. Um, you might not choose to do that, but on, on back straps uh, going to consumers in Shanghai, you might have quite a different answer, mm -hmm. and there could be a different answer again for tripe. Um, so you know, to, to, to try and take one answer for the meat industry, I think, is, is flawed. I think there are really good opportunities um, initially for niches, but I think out of, if we can find some nutritional benefits that demonstrate that grass-fed is fundamentally better for you than uh, industrially raised animals or those sort of things, I think we have an opportunity to lift the, the sector uh, as a whole. So uh, there's some work going on on that with Beef and Lamb again and MIA collaborating on a, on a research project on that. Um, and I think it's in that collaboration space that we'll find opportunities uh, to get a tide that lifts all boats. Um, just Andrew, on trade volatility, I mean, we heard two very interesting um, presentations as well uh, from Jim and also from Jeff. But, um, you know, obviously problems with Brexit dislocation, what might happen there? 
Um, but also, I think Jim drew out the dynamics of uh, trade, and he talked about the role that Mike Pompeo and Mike Pence are playing in the United States, which tends to suggest that Winston Peters was actually seeing the right people when he was out there promoting a bilateral FTA for us. But um, it's still quite difficult. So how do you manage markets in this sort of situation? Oh, probably probably not, ask, well, not asking me. What I, I suppose what, it's, what I've witnessed as I've come into this role, I think the meat industry's done a great job of, we talk about commodities, these guys, you know, they reconfigure their cuts into 220 different uh, specialty cuts and then go up to 110, 110, 120 different markets. And it's not becoming over-reliant on any single market. And I suspect we felt slightly volatile when um, we entered the EU, then they did a lot of morphing out of that. Felt slightly volatile with their exposure in the EU when this Brexit thing broke. And so what we just got to do is just follow, uh, remember the lessons we've learned about volatility and exposing too much on a single market and then just work out how we just do that new product differentiation into new markets. Now that's, you know, the difficulty. I suppose one of the things when, you, when John responded there, maturity of industry, I'm really pleased with. We've never had a, what you'd call a sort of a, an assurance program, a national farm assurance program before, and we've never ever across this sector had, a, what don't want to call it an origin brand, a, a brand that will support our provenance stories around grass feed. And that sort of sits under to support the uh, the companies do their own branding. So as we build on that stuff, and then when Pierre did his presentation mm. around potential pathway to market work, this is all the stuff we've got to look at, because we're going to know that the world's not going to be the same next year. Mm. I mean, that's a point also, um, Lindy, I'd like you to chime in here. When, when we're talking about that pathway to market and the use of the food basket innovation and, and, and that, I mean, as a small producer, you must be pretty um, excited by all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually quite excited about food tourism, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, my passion is for women in our sector. I like men as well. I've married to <laughs> one for 32 years. Um, I think there's a real opportunity for, for women to actually get involved on farm. Um, yeah, I could see some challenges around mm -hmm. actually how, I think you'd have to have a group of small producers mm -hmm. that came under one brand to do that. But yeah, I think there is a real opportunity for food tourism um, and that, that kind of really excites me. How, how to give them a, a, a fantastic on-farm experience um, and particularly when we have to look at, you know, under the ETS, diversifying some of our income or where we get some of our income from, I think this could be a, a real opportunity. Mm -hmm. Before I go out to all of you, because this is, is your opportunity as well, and I, I already had one or two people who'd like to um, either make comments or challenges relating to trade, in particular, some of the uh, environmental shifts there. Um, I'm, I'm sort of interested also about the politics at the moment, and, and just how did you feel after listening to Corin Dan, inching towards possibly doing something, possibly on GE sometime? forging a bipartisan consensus, saying we've got the water statement coming up as well. I mean, what are you going to be telling the politicians? <coughs> All of you. <laughs> well, obviously not enough. Um, I did challenge Colin. Is he, is he still here? Has he left? I did say the one thing I thought he missed out is um, how Jacinda was going to play going into the elections because I said, surely we're going to have a wedding, the baby's going to be rolled out a little <laughs> bit more. Uh, and he challenged me back and he said, that's her personal choice. And I said, yeah, that's, uh, that's good. I, I think we've lost that ability, Fran. I think back mm -hmm. um, around uh, John Floon's era, mm. um, it's showing my age, and I think that, that level of politicians... Uh, really interacted really well with the farming sector. But I think there is kind of a disconnect. I mean, we've got federated farmers, absolutely. Beef and lamb do a great job. But are they actually connecting with farmers? And are we using our influence the way we should? And kind of was a wake-up call for me this afternoon when I was listening to some of those messages and thought, yep, we've actually got to take a little bit more ownership here. Uh, I always find... Um um, positions of responsibility quite confusing. Personally, I find them quite confusing what you do. Mm -hmm. And I would challenge some of our politicians they find when they get into these positions that they might have been sitting waiting for nine years, that when they get there, they sub suddenly want to do something. Like I've always viewed the role of government as a, as a role of as an, as an enabler 
as opposed to a regulator. A regulator should, regulation should be the last form if you can't actually work out your enabling steps or put the right levers to pull. Um, so, like, I think they came in there reasonably hard, made some pretty, like, some, we talked about the oil and gas call in the Taranaki. What I've witnessed recently in trying to spend this last week, you know, like, I'm hoping there's some thought coming into it now, because at the end of the day, I think as New Zealanders, we all want the same results, but, you know, unintended consequence by poorly thought out policy. We have some pretty good histories of doing that across the years. I use the land development clearance mm -hmm. loans that led to a lot of our water quality problems that we're experiencing today. I'll use the blunt instrument of um, putting a certain pine tree up on some erosion based land and now we're spraying off 1.6 million hectares of welding pine. So I suppose what I'm saying is it's actually incumbent and that's why I like working with everyone. It's not about saying no to government, it's about better come with coming up with a better idea and that's what we're trying to work towards. Yeah, I try to look through the politicians to Middle New Zealand, and I think um, you know, Middle New Zealand expects us to do better in some things. Uh, I think we've got a job to help Middle New Zealand to understand the realities of what we're doing, and we haven't done that well enough. But I think in, in some areas, you know, the reality is that the river I live beside is not the river that I swam in as a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a bunch of things that we do need to do better and I think if we want to have influence in New Zealand uh, we've got to be credible with middle New Zealand and if we can and, and I'm I'm sensing that the politicians are following middle New Zealand rather than leading it these days and I think that's our opportunity okay yeah. um, just going out to those of you in the room I do know Mike Peterson you wanted to make a point on trade are you here ah yeah, they're going to throw you the mic. <laughs> well, look, thanks, Fran. And look, I, um, I was actually going to make a broader point, really, okay, around... Mm -hmm. uh, look, I, I think there's a real... We're at a real critical crossroads, in my view, in the sector. We have got incredibly good product prices, um, you know, so that side of the equation looks, looks pretty good. Confidence is not at a high level, and most of that is because some of the policy uncertainty at the moment. But... You know, I think we are on the cusp of an incredible opportunity, and the question for me to the panel, from me to the panel, is do, is the sector bold enough to take that? Is the sector bold enough to look at the uh, in transformational change that's happening in the route to the consumer? With we heard today, the mix, the, the merging of online and in-store retailing. You know, the alternative proteins that are coming down the market. Uh, you look at some of the trade issues that we're facing offshore that are becoming more protectionist rather than more open-mindedness. The only way, in my view, that we're going to push through that is to be really bold around what we want to do to transform the sector both environmentally, and I know that this is a sensitive subject and I'll get a few rocks later on, um, but how do we actually get a right ahead of the game in climate change? Be more aspirational. The millennials, my kids, mm. they don't want to see us just do incremental change. And they are the people that will be buying our products. And the challenge for me to the panel is, you know, how prepared is the sector really to move forward? Look at this from the outside in. If consumers and the people uh, aren't liking the story that we're telling them, then we're telling them the wrong story. And so, you know, I think we need to do better. And so I'm, I'm issuing a challenge here to the panel, I guess, to, you know, how bold are we prepared to be? Because at the moment it looks like we're trying to sort of defend the status quo by just convincing ourselves that if we prove to them that the science means that animals don't ruin the environment, everything will be okay. I travel to Europe a lot, um, in France and Germany. Uh, you know, the use of glyphosate, in my view, will be banned by 2023. The politicians say, Mike, you don't understand, the science is irrelevant in this. The people have spoken. When it comes to climate change in the US, where you've just been, Andrew, there are many of those discerning consumers that are saying, look, uh, we want to, the science is almost irrelevant. We want you to be able to claim that you are zero carbon when it comes to producing your food. And what does that actually challenge us to do back here at home? So thanks, Fran. That's okay. Right, all of you. Who wants first go at that? Look, okay, Mike, look, I mean, I agree with you, mate. And I mean, and this is the challenge we have, but then the challenge is with, as we have these aspirational goals, you have to provide the tools and the mechanisms that the, then you can take to your farmers and they say, look, yeah, first they get the reason why we're doing it, 
Second, they get, a, they get a picture of a vision of what we can achieve when we do it. And then third, we have to provide the tools and the support so that they can do it. Because I mean, all the change or the reticence to change is driven by fear. And we all know what that's like in our rural communities. You know, we've got some pretty high debt loadings. Um, we've got some pretty established ways of thinking. So look, when you can't see a pathway through that, of course you're going to react in a negative situation. So that's the real challenge to leaders, I think, Mike, or leadership groups, that we can actually answer those, the, the, the why we want to do it, the value proposition, and the tools and the pathways through for people. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty hard to convince them. We got some pretty nasty emails when we announced that climate change commitment the other day, driven by fear from some of the farming community. And you can understand that. Yeah, Mike, you, you, you went here, here when I made my opening comments, but uh, um, I, I personally think we're not yet bold enough, uh, so I'll be honest about that. Um, I do think, though, that the first thing we've got to do is make sure that we get sensible <laughs> legal frameworks in place. Because if we're dead, we're not going to be able to do anything that's useful. Um, so that's, that's the first thing we've got to do. Um, but I, I do think that... You know, the world is changing rapidly, um, that affluent global consumers who are the ones we want to get the money out of their wallets have very, very high expectations and we either meet them or we don't feed them. Lindy? Yeah, I, I think we're not bold, but that's the role of the leader, isn't it? To enable success in others, so that comes back to leaders in the sector, to instil that confidence, have a vision, have a pathway forward and <coughs> enable them. And actually, you know, through the Red Meat Profit Partnership, we've actually had a lot of investment um, in, in people in our sector. So it's, it, it's there, but all, the, all of those other things. But it comes back to leadership. If we can clarify a real vision and a solution and then enable others to success, then we should get there. Just another comment. I think leadership will be part of it. I think collaboration will be another part of it. I, mean, I think that we are, you know, there are, there are some things we do really well out of New Zealand that are niche things. Um, but in lamb and beef, we need to go beyond ultra niche uh, to have real impact. And I, I suspect collaboration will be an important part of capturing our potential. So Lockwood. Thanks, Fran. No. I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to disagree slightly with my old mate Mike Good. over there because, <laughs> Mike, for God's sake, if we depart from sound science, we will make climate change worse. We must make sure that what we do is based on real science. And I come back to what Professor Leroy uh, said to us this morning. You know, it's, it's just so important that that happens. But I want, can I put this to you guys? Can I congratulate you first on your commitment to uh, to the, the the unified action from the agriculture sector on on climate change on on methane in particular, I think that is a fabulous step forward, and I really sincerely congratulate you on it. I think it's the the biggest step I've seen in 20 years of the for the agriculture sector to take a, a lead that can put us right at the forefront in the world on this. What troubles me is I sense the government is still quite keen to press ahead with its dopey levy at processor level on, uh, on primary products, which will achieve absolutely nothing. Uh, it might actually hit the more carbon efficient farmers the most. Uh, it might, goodness sake, it might uh, cause farmers to produce a bit more to make up for the loss of income from that, that levy, which will actually have exactly the opposite. You mentioned perverse outcomes, mm. and my God, over my political life have I seen plenty of those. <laughs> so, team, my question to you is really, what has the government reaction been to this extraordinary commitment you've made that could, has the possibility to actually position New Zealand right at the forefront of of uh, methane emission work globally for the primary sector uh, and uh, because if they don't grab it the they will lose this opportunity what's what's the reaction been from them so starting out from our point I was kind of nervous when they threw you that box there's so locker I didn't know what you're gonna ask me <laughs> but uh, so starting out like we, we and I'll use the example of beef and lamb we'd scoped this a lot you know going into this potential zero carbon bill and when that announcement came out like I was physically I was just gutted 
because mm. you know if, if it's not based on science you say and it's based on through a tri-party political deal to look good well like i was pretty down so sam gave me a pick your socks up sort of a type talk the next day after we'd um gone off and met with the prime minister and they, they still come out with this announcement but um I th it's got to be science based why this has to be science based because this is not only new zealand we're talking about here this is glow we should have the ability <laughs> To, what a success looks like to me is standing shoulder to shoulder with government saying this is global policy constructed on science and this is something that you can take out to the world because this is what we fundamentally believe in. If we make it into a political circus, well I, make, I, mean, I can't stand there shoulder to shoulder and say we've got the best policy to drive the best results. So that's, that's the place where we're challenged at and it's been great because then we've got to work with all the other sector groups and that delivers real strength to a conversation. And we have had the conversation. It's always great to be nice and front up and put your arm around somebody. Sometimes you've got to toe up to the line sometimes. So I hope we never have to get to that point. I hope they see the Farming Leaders Group as a voice of reason for the best way to deliver the change we actually need to deliver. That's what I hope for. Yeah, I'm, I'm slightly more sceptical. Um, <laughs> um, I tend to think that the government's positioned itself with a bob each way strategy. It's got the commitment that it can take if it wants it, and it can play for more. And I think it's beholden to the sector um, more of the, the green agenda. Um, and I think it's beholden on the sector to advocate incredibly strongly through the next phase and hold it at the commitment level and not to give, uh, not to give them scope to squeeze more out. Well, I wasn't involved in any of it, but what I um, was impressed with is what Beef and Lamb have done around engaging farmers and encouraging them to have their say and supporting them through those um, submission processes. So I think you're going to get a farmer's voice through that, which is, which is great to see. And, and I think the one thing that I would like to call out is, you know, it's great working with all that group and the farming leaders group, you know, the chairs of decans, MIA, Dairy NZ, Beef and Lamb, Hort New Zealand, Irrigation New Zealand, FAR. So if you can all get there together, apiculture. What was the slight disappointment then? We couldn't all land on our collective submissions. So that shows that we still don't quite have the maturity that we need in the sector. That's my personal view. So Graham, I see you've got the green microphone. <laughs> Thank you, friend, for the opportunity. There you go. The big thing for me this morning was listening to Professor Lera, mm -hmm. Le Leroy, and, to, and he reminded me of actually uh, how deficient we are mm -hmm. in terms of leadership in our academic community. Mm -hmm. uh, I've tried to do it myself in terms of trade mm -hmm. with a professorial chair at Lincoln, and it failed within the academic community. Yeah. So we'll try again. But actually, we have a problem. We have a problem in terms of advocacy across the uh, tertiary education sector. So I think as a, as a sector, the meat sector, we've got to get more active. We've got to get more active in terms of setting up some key professorial chairs and maybe postdoctoral students with that and also back to domestic students actually going in to the agri-food sector. It's a big problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, both Andy and I have been involved with one institution as a continuing problem. So my challenge is to the, to the panel, how do you think we should go about fixing it? Mm. I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're 100% uh, uh, right, Sir Graham, because, I mean, this is once again something that was constructed in the 80s. It was a contestable funding model for both, for, you know, tertiary training, vocational mm. training, and then CRIs. And it was this fundamental belief that if you pit a scientist against another scientist, against another university, <laughs> against another, it was going to deliver the results that uh, they wanted. OK, so then you've got to sit now and what are we, 30 years on down the track, and go, oh, geez, did that really deliver what we thought it was going to deliver? Mm. And we've got to be bold enough to say, well, no, that's not cutting it. So, um, yeah, it's, and so that's one of the conversations. When we, if we can land the sector vision, what are the other sector enablers that we have to then challenge government to change to help deliver that result? The other thing, Sir Graham, that it's, so I'm very mindful of, as we have all these discussions in agriculture, what is attracting young people in? Mm. If all we're having is negative discussions around we're not doing enough of this stuff or you're, you're a bunch of guys that just pollute waterways and put 
you know, so that's the, the, the narrative's got to change significantly before we get the young people entering. Uh, look, I, I, this, this is not an issue I've given a lot of thought to, so I don't have an answer at my fingertips. But I think uh, there's a chunk of uh, us needing to get greater positive perceptions of the sector in the gov you know, various governments over the years, particularly Labor governments, have tended to see um, the primary sector as a sunset in industry. Um, whereas, in fact, you know, despite those prophecies from as far back as Longy, uh, the sector has grown and grown in productivity and grown in output and grown in contributions in New Zealand. Um, and it would make sense for New, Ze for New Zealand to be championing, championing it um, and creating the environment for uh, academic leadership. Um, we've, we've got to drive the start of that and I think that's part of uh, our sector having a, a stronger voice is, is, is the start of that. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how, the, how the path plays out from there, but unless we are uh, championing our sector more, more robustly than we are, uh, we won't make much progress there. So I think other, other parts of, so some parts of horticulture have done a really, really good job in terms of the young people mm -hmm. in, in telling stories. And I think with the opportunities are, offer, are open to us too because when people think of the meat industry, they think of people in white gumboots uh, and white clothes on a plant. And, but there are some great jobs in the sector um, uh, and there'll be more of them uh, as we go into a new future. Uh, there'll be jobs, in, there are jobs already in the marketplace, there will be far more of those in, in my view. There are jobs in the supply chain, uh, there are jobs in science, there are jobs in quality control and so forth and um, I don't think, and there, there are jobs in farm management um, and uh, sophisticated farm management that's going to be part of our future. So I think we have a big job to do in uh, convincing young people that this part of the primary sector uh, also offers great things to young t in terms of careers. Is the Brent, can I just make a few comments on that? Yep. <laughs> Sam McIver from Beef and Land New Zealand. I guess the... Um, more recently, if you're involved in the rural sector, you would have heard about the demise of Taratahi. I guess that's been a little bit of a lightning rod for a pretty inherent issue right through all of our uh, training institutions. I think this, along with uh, Minister Hipkins, I guess, proposal to restructure the whole uh, education sector has, has provided quite a good opportunity for us. And so what we've done in recent times, we've put together a joint industry group that sits right across primary industries and we have proposed to the Minister, with the help of MPI, a joint governance approach to how, uh, I guess, tertiary education, uh, on-farm training and, and associated training is actually uh, funded by government. So, so for me it's very strongly about a, a philosophy of being in charge of our own destiny and that's about, a, I think, a message we've heard often today is that uh, industry has to get in the driving seat of thinking about policy, thinking about what it needs, and actually putting that in front of uh, government. So that's something we're very active in right now. Uh, Malcolm Bailey, I've got a couple of comments and then a question. Uh, firstly, when it comes to the challenge around climate change uh, and water quality in New Zealand, I think we've got no choice but to be ambitious to support the 2050 goal that's in the uh, zero carbon bill. But at the same time, we can't move away from the science. And in support of Sir Lockwood, I think we must very firmly support science. Just think of one example which exists not only in New Zealand but other countries. We've got a group of anti-vaccination people completely dismissing the science. And look at the price that we're starting to pay for that. Mm. We must be the champions of, of good science here because two things. One, science is underpinning the challenge in the first place, so how can you start to validate your response unless you have the science supporting you uh, in, in response to that? When it comes to our positioning though, New Zealand's in a brilliant place in terms of many other uh, primary sector producers in the world to respond to this challenge and do really well. So again, we need the science to underpin our relative position and, and go forward with that. So in terms of where to from here, 
when I'm looking at one of the key tools which I think we need to unlock, it is what can we do with gene editing in this country? And I think mm. Fran was trying to flush you out earlier around mm. this, and I'd like to ask you, you know, what is the way forward in terms of how do we utilise some of the tools that exist in other parts of the world which we're not utilising here? Who wants to go first? <laughs> you. <laughs> oh no, Lindy, where you go? What is the way forward? Yeah, I think I think we have to relook at that. Um, what we do, I mean, we have to have some tools to combat methane, particularly. So, you know, are we up for that conversation? And then, we, then are we up to the emotion that comes with that conversation? <coughs> and how do we actually manage that. But I think if we construct it and we get an opinion first and then take it to the New Zealand public, I think that is, is possibly the answer. In terms of science, look, I, th I think the sector for some, for some years has looked at science as a basis for denial. Uh, we now need to look at science as, firstly, how do we achieve the standards that the community expects for us and I actually think there's an opportunity beyond that to premiumise by outperformance and, and scientific leadership. So I think we, we, you know, science will play a critical part in, in that. Um, gene editing, I've got to take my horticultural hats off at the moment for, to answer this question, because I think gene editing means different things in different places <laughs> uh, and creates opportunities for some and threats for others. Um, but certainly for pastoral farming in New Zealand, I think it does it does provide opportunities. You need to, we need to understand the extent, though, to which parts of our sector depend on perceptions of naturalness, because it's hard to substantiate gene editing and naturalness perceptions, and that's, that, that's where horticulture, I think, will struggle, particularly. I think the conversation is maturing, you know, from and the state of being the transgenic and the cisgenic. And I mean, that's a completely different discussion, isn't it? Genes from ducks into rabbits versus just the, the CRISPR technology in this space. Um, I think the, um, to, to John's point though, I think it's time we have the debate in New Zealand. It was really disappointing when we had the oil and gas um, policy change there where the response was, well, technology will answer your, will answer the calls we've made here. And you go, well, that's cool, but if you're gonna make other calls here, well, if you fundamentally uh, don't allow the technology to be enabled, well, that's, that's an unfair call. But I think we need to have a discussion as a country around what our views on that were, <coughs> because um, there is sometimes a market perception, not unlike the glyphosate discussion that Mike injected there. Let's say we really, we supported it here, none of our customers wanted to buy it because they had a different view, then we kind of get ourselves into a difficult position. Science will, should inform that answer. Science may not always inform that answer. You know, if, if we had our vision for where we wanted our food to be in 2050, and if we look at the predictions of what it's going to look like in 2050, it's not pretty. If we had a vision in New Zealand, and then a strategy that underpinned it, you would bring in science and health and education and <coughs> immigration, and everything would come under that because you had a very clear vision of where we needed to land mm. in 2050. So. I think developing something like that will then allow those conversations to actually come through and allow all everyone to come together and talk about that. I 100% agree because that becomes into the conversation of the enablers. You know, if yep. the enablers is the funding of um, science or local government review or any of these levers that actually deliver the result, yeah, I think you're correct there. I think there's quite a bit of work going on on the vision for the primary sector, and it's interesting the Farming Leaders Group developed a, a, uh, a vision about a year ago, and it was something along the lines of working with nature uh, to produce the world's most trusted and valued food in the world's most beautiful place. Now, the Primary Sector Council have come up with something very, very similar. So I think the vision, the, the vision is, is just about there. And, and, and there's no real disagreement with it. And, you know, it, it's got that concept of value. It's got that concept of trust. Uh, it's got working with nature. It's preserving the beauty of New Zealand, or reinstating it in some cases. Um, and uh, so I think the, I think the vision, there's, there's, no, there's no debate about the vision. It's, it's not formalised yeah, yet. But I think the vision is for how we see the world now. Okay, I don't think the vision is for what the world is potentially going to be in, 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 in 2050. 
Uh, well, I suppose we better wait and see what the vision is, and that's the difficulty, <laughs> the difficulty of it. I'm pretty confident that, uh, yeah. Okay. I think, are you all okay if I take a couple more questions? Because theoretically we're out of time, but um, you're having such a good time out there, so all right. Yeah. Um, uh, Patrick Hutchinson, I'm from the Australian Meat Industry Council, so I apologise for the accent um, and the wallabies um, and the cricket <laughs> and the netball. Um, she had pretty much everything. So, um, what I'd, uh, wh wh where I'd, wh I'd like to take this is, if I cut and paste this uh, discussion and and threw it a, a few hundred kilometres uh, to the west, um, I, we're having the same discussion, mm. almost exactly. Mm. Um, and and the parameters around it are, are also very clear. You know, as Australians, we're looking for four thousand. We have 4,000 vacancies in our processing plants today, every day. Um, we are tackling a number of different key areas and items in regards to uh, environment and sustainability, v somewhat different. Uh, water, obviously, exactly the same, small little thing <coughs> called Murray-Darling. Um, uh, but uh, also, we, we, we have to tackle land clearing and, uh, and what have you. But um, also, uh, I, I think, um, uh, the issues of vegans, I mean, uh, we've had vegans come into processing facilities, chain themselves up to it, um, and in fact glue themselves to the main streets of Melbourne and <laughs> shut them down for five hours, which uh, propelled that issue into the limelight and in a way that we, that country has never seen before. So mm. I, I think what, what my, that, that's certainly around a, a, a commentary. My question is then, where do you think internationally we should go? I think we seem to be, we've got our domestic issues, but we seem to, they're, they're relatively the same. And the, the key fear that I had was in discussions, and uh, Tim and I, uh, as, as counterparts, are actually working on a bigger, bolder vision uh, around a more global meat alliance. Mm -hmm. But in any, in any event, I'd be very keen to hear from you in regards to what you see potentially could be that one of those global issues that we could all tackle together. But then secondly, um, I, I'm also very keen to, to hear from you about where you then also see how we need to be interacting with our customers together. We're not going to agree on the EU because you've got one to two more tonnes in lamb than we do. Um, but but uh, bugger all, just, just like the, <laughs> the beautiful little... Uh, the only time we've won in the last 10 years was uh, chilled exports to China. But there you go. The, I'm also very keen to hear that too. <laughs> I'm also pretty keen to hear uh, around those areas too because uh, uh, the EU have already said to us that they believe in the next FTA negotiation we're going through, animal welfare is going to be an actual mandatory component. Now, to me, that's moving well away from where mm. the, uh, I think it was talked about before, the, um, <laughs> uh, uh, the trading rules are. Once that happens, then sustainability will kick in then many other areas will kick in. So pretty keen to hear from what people think. And also, uh, John, I'll pass it back to you. The only bad pass he's done all day is to hit the Australians in the head here, so. <laughs> Waking you up, boys. <laughs> okay, team. Uh, look, I think areas where we can collaborate uh, cross country is firstly around uh, the truth about greenhouse gas emissions and the impact of animals on the environment. Um, it'll be slightly different in different places with different farming regimes, but a lot of the principles will be the same. I think the role of meat in balanced diets uh, is a thing that will be uh, a global uh, issue. So I think there's there, those two stand out for me. Um, uh, I think, you know, to me, animal welfare, I, it, partly that's going to be a trade issue, but frankly it's going to be an access to channel issues. I mean, at the end of the day, um, consumers now have very high expectations that are uh, unrealistic in terms of our past, but they have to be our future. I mean, the money starts with the consumer and you only prize their wallets open by, uh, by, by meeting their expectations. So uh, to me that's, uh, that's going to be a matter of... Uh, of performance rather than compliance. Yeah, those two, and maybe education. I mean, that's obviously an area that we're struggling with at the moment. Uh, so I think that's an area for collaboration. 
Yeah, look, I think there's multiple areas. All those, the reasons why somebody would move off consuming air products, which, you know, be it the sheep or the beef, the reasons why, which is always that GHG, biodiversity <coughs> damage, uh, water quality, any of those things, it actually doesn't matter where you do that science because we're all going to have to do that science. And so we might as well just do it together. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, in the markets, I mean, the great thing is we actually all produce quite different products especially in the US, what they produce in the sheep meat, what you guys put into the US market, it's quite different than our stuff. Um, and if I use the term in the US, I mean they eat one pound per person per day, it's actually diddly squat. So if we did a concerted effort and doubled the, the, uh, the market into the US, um, none of us would have enough sheep meat, I'm just using that as an example, to supply that market. So, and I mean, and that's only one market, and what are they, 300 and something million people? So. It's because, especially sheep meat is such a small category, I think there's lots of stuff we could do together. Uh, any one last <coughs> final question? Yeah, sorry, William Just Beetham. Just very quickly, because <laughs> this is the last, I know. <laughs> um, so, William Beetham, sheep and beef farmer from Wider Upper. It's probably more, um, the, my question is probably pretty simple, but um, it's based more around the people on the ground um, and extension. We, you know, if we just look a few years ago in the sector with the people on the ground, we were focusing on productivity and, and how much we can really produce off our land. That, that as we've heard today, the entire dynamics changed, um, and it's often difficult to get change amongst farmers in the best of times. Um, and this could create the worst of times in terms of, um, you know, pushback and, uh, you know, trying to get farmers to think it's not so much about what you do anymore, it's how you look doing it. So I suppose, um, it's really a question, um, extension, how do we start to embrace with those farmers on the ground um, in terms of, hey, we need to move forward in this process and we need to embrace it as opposed to, and, and that's actually real extension on the ground, not just uh, standing up above and saying you have to do this. I'm happy to take that one. Um, <laughs> also, definitely one thing that we've been doing with the Agri Women's Development Trust with the RMPP is actually looking at that and when couples come on our, our programs that we're looking at that whole farm plan in terms of profit, <laughs> planet, people and progress and thinking about how they incorporate those. So, you know, we basically we can't, it's not an infinite resource, you know, we've got a finite resource and how they think about that on farm. And that is, I've been, I've been blown away by when you channel their thinking into those four areas how quickly they come to think about on-farm practice change. So, you know, that is my experience. Um, and the extension there, you know, it's been phenomenal to see a farming couple grow as a business team. And that's pretty exciting stuff. That's how I was gonna answer the question too, uh, William, because we've spent the seven, last seven years with RMPP trying to crack the code. And effectively, that's what the action networks are there to do. And so that's why we've invested significant money in that space and even to the extent as we're trying to still incentivise that pickup, until we get to the point where the farmers themselves see the value and will pay for that in their business themselves, you know, that that's, looks like nirvana to me because then there's a commercial model wrapped around it. We only play in the, uh, the market failure space and the commodity levy space. We've got to get it to the space where the, the, there's a market in that space and people see the value for it. Can we just about call the we panel can. out? Did we can. Uh, I've, I've given a task here to, to make some summaries and it's very difficult to do it, but people who know me, I've always got a comment. Um, and one of the comments that I would like to pick up on you, uh, Sir Graham, was that how do we get educated people, in, people into the industry? And there's one place we have to start at and that's schools. Yeah. We've got to get into the curriculum, we've got to explain about our, our science and even down to uh, global warming. <clears throat> I mean, it sits, the carbon cycle sits in every, in every biology um, syllabus. So I think we need to get to schools, we need to tell them about the jobs, we need to, and this is not a, just a passive sort of thing, I think it's got to be aggressive because they are going to be the next consumers, the, the next voters. Um, I, I think we've, we've failed to do what I had the good fortune to do and you had good fortune to do and Craig Hicks had the good fortune to do. We were given scholarships by the industry or to go and study at university. And 
Zoom in on the kids. And you know what? Kids teach their parents a lot. Mm. They can come home and tell stories that, that uh, parents actually listen to. So um, that's, that's my comment there. Um, thank you, team. I think we've had a wonderful finish to the, to the, uh, to the conference. Um, I am also told that I should do some summaries. I've got one-liners here from Frederick Leroy. Farmers work with nature, not against it. And one lovely little hook that I think as a marketing person we should all hang on to, fake meat is, made to, is not made to save the world, but for food press processes to make profits. I think if we put the food processing label over the top of fake meat, it would actually help a lot of, um, a better perspective to that. And Michael Berger, Michael Berger makes burgers with grass fed and well done Michael, we, that's, that's the sort of thing that we need. Jeff Grant and Jim Richards, the one thing that came out of their conversation was uncertainty. And uncertainty is something we've all got to deal with. We've got to deal with it in, in political sense. We've got to deal with it in financial senses. And it's, it's not comforting to know that things are uncertain, but reality of it is life is uncertain. So there's nothing new to that. And there was one point that I liked from Jeff when he told me that Welsh prices were dearer or cheaper than New Zealand prices and they didn't have anywhere to sell it. Now, me as a trader thought, great, We'll go and buy it from, <laughs> from Wales and sell it to Hong Kong. <laughs> There's always opportunities. Look for them. Um, Pierre showed us there was real opportunity if we could get retail-ready product into the market in China. And I think the final piece of wisdom I gained from the whole conference was from Corin and Kirk. And it takes me back to the story when we bought an MMP. And someone came up to me and said, look, we've, we've traded first past the post for third past the post. <laughs> and yes. it was a joke. But really, mm. I think what we need to do is to get our policies mm. in to New Zealand first. Mm. Get them on side. <laughs> they might not go with National, they might not go with Labour, or they might not even get in, but at least they are the team who's going to have the biggest influence for us. And on that thought, <laughs> I will call the conference to a close. <laughs> and I've got some gifts here from the large, well-run South Island Meat Companies. Not for you, no. I think you're probably okay. <laughs> 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 and sorry, John, you don't get one on. Okay, no. thanks very much. This is the first time ever I'll go home with the meat. <laughs> Oh, I think we've got the wrong, I think we're a swap. Yeah. All right. Just now, Andrew, I think you're going to, you're going to you. summarise those? Yeah, I was just going to close out, okay. so I was just going to say don't be leaving, it just quite is yet. If I go to here, will this feedback through the speaker? Okay, look, I just want to thank you all for coming today. Look, I apologise for being late here, and I missed the first two speakers this morning, and actually... I read through uh, I read through the professor's slides before I came here, and I thought eighty slides. I thought that's fantastic. There was just such depth in that stuff, and it was it was obviously two fantastic presentations. What we've tried to do here today is scope out the challenge that there's a lot of issues um, facing our sector at the moment, but I don't think that's any different. There will always be issues facing sectors at any given time, and that's why I used the reference before with those funds that we um, I'm involved with. You know sure as houses every time you're going to go in and review the funds and go, well, we're going through pretty volatile times, going through pretty volatile times, and every time you go there, they say exactly the same thing. So we've got some challenges now, and maybe some of them are a little larger than we would have hoped them to be, but I think what we wanted to do was put them front and centre with of you today, um, and then we wanted to have a discussion, and this was what the panel session was about, is what are we going to do about that? Because there's nothing worse than seeing a problem and leaving the room thinking nobody's thinking about it. And so that's where, you know, I think the message that I'd like to just give to give you guys is um, 
There's numerous examples now where we're trying to work more in the collaborative space because these are some big issues and we'd be wasting our time trying to sort them ourselves. I'll use the example of Jeff who represented here today. You know, that was a, that's a big issue, you know, what 40% of our sheep meat by value going into that EU market. Um, when that first broke, that was quite concerning. So MIA and Beef and Lamb co-funding that position up there, I hope you saw the value of that in the way that Jeff presented here today. We've just created a new policy position back in the States too, with uh, Jim presenting over the, the, uh, the differing views of trade and protectionist over there. We, we'd, we'd pulled our resource out of there, but we have put a resource back into Washington now because there's some, uh, there's some headwinds starting to develop in those conversations. And so they really want to thank Jim for being down here today. This is pretty special to get him down. And that's all because you build relationships in the places where you need to build the relationships. I did reference as I was sitting there, this is the first time that we've ever had a national farm assurance program in our sector. And we are going to have to keep building on that. When this primary sector council comes out with a vision and the expectations around what some people will say is regulations on farms, versus what we would view as information we're prepared to give to our customers to provide that premium opportunity. I don't think we should be surprised that farm assurance programs, farm environment plans that deliver value will be a thing that we will all be involved with going forward. Um, but there's got to be a clear vision and a need while we're doing that and we want to put that to you. We've got one now, it's great, and we're levering off that with the Taste Pure Nature initiative. One of the our retiring directors, Kirsten Bryant, said to me before she retired, in the old days, whenever you got change when you, in your industry, you went home and you farmed a little harder and you either cleared a bit more of the bush block or you knocked some tussocks over and you whacked a few more stock units on. Well, we don't think that'll be happening going forward, you know, in relation to biodiversity preservation, water quality, climate change, you know, there may be a situation where we have to actually reduce our ruminant production and look for some other revenue generators on the farm. So hence the reason we have to create and capture as much value as we can in the market collaboratively through any initiatives that we can. And now we don't want to necessarily own that space, but we it's a known known that we're going to have to do that. Sorry, I keep waffling on. So some of the things is that I do want to call out to is this collaboration between MIA and Beef and Lamb. It's been really, really good. And then building on that with the Farming Leaders Group, especially on, you know, this climate change has been a very fearful space for people when the policy came out. So to have the ability to, to coordinate with all those other groups, and I do want to do a call out, I forgot to mention Federation of Maori Authorities, which is involved too when I listed all those names before. Now that's really, really important that we have the Federation of Maori Authorities there and really want to acknowledge that here today. And then as I say, the time we've spent at Tihono looking at the, um, the opportunities going forth, you know, hopefully the industry was a very collaborative process and something will come out of that. I want to thank you all for being here today. At conference is not much fun if nobody fronts up. <laughs> and the other thing, I really want to thank all the speakers that come, and I hope the calibre of speakers, I, from what I saw, was fantastic, and I hope it added value to your businesses and that you feel like you're getting something out of this. I want to call out uh, Beverly Dixon and Fiona Bowie, who organised the day. Like, uh, these things don't come together, and if you just give them a round of applause. Uh, who was it before? Oh, it was Corin Dan said, uh, look, oh, it's just it's the best time ever to be in, in media at the moment because of all this stuff going on. He feels like it's an inspiring place. What I'd like you guys to leave the room and, and ask yourselves, I would say this is a, a really exciting time to be in our sector. And whenever you get, I always look back to the 80s, you know, a lot of us have, well, I'm 54, entered the uh, agriculture in the 80s. And all that guidance counsellor said, you got rocks in your head, you know, this, there's no future in that game, get out of it. Look at what it's delivered for our sector when we had some challenges and the people who entered it, look what they've achieved. And I always joke, it was all us halfwits that entered the ag sector and look what the halfwits have achieved. <laughs> Imagine when we get all these smart people entering in. So I see this as a fantastic time. <laughs> I do always joke about that, I think it's fantastic. So... Um, Look, I just think it's such an opportunity and what we've got is the challenge is that we work closely to construct the right policy 
and put the right people and the right collaboration that just gives this uh, sector the opportunity that's just sitting there waiting to be taken. So look, it's clear that we've got that passion in the room. That's why you guys are here. And uh, I think we can collectively get through this. All right. For those of us who are coming to the Marisk dinner tonight, uh, the pre-drinks will be starting at 6.30. It's at the Transitional Cathedral just down the road on Hereford Street. Um, for those of you who are heading off and not coming to dinner, I really want to thank you for being here and I would encourage you to keep in contact with your organisation, be it MIA, Beef and Lamb New Zealand or whoever, and just keep challenging us to do the stuff that we need to do for your sector. In the interest of sustainability, please leave your name tags and lanyards on the table when you leave and we'll use them again uh, next year or another conference. And just to close up, and thank you very much for coming and we'll see those of you who are joining us for dinner tonight. Thank you.